it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Julian Parkhill from Cambridge, who is a deserving winner of the 2021 Marjorie Stevenson Prize, which we award to an individual who has made exceptional contributions to the discipline of microbiology. Julian is best known for his research on bacterial genomes, which he has worked on since the very early days of genomics, initially analyzing reference genomes for many important human and animal pathogens, then his group moved on to comparative genomics and subsequently large-scale population genomics as the technologies all developed. He's primarily focused his analysis on the evolution of bacterial pathogens, looking at their origin, transmission, and adaptation to selective pressure. His current work uses large-scale population genomics to identify the global origin and the roots of spread of human and animal pathogens. Addressing adaptation to host, to antibiotics and to vaccine pressure. Most recently, he's been developing new bacterial genome-wide association approaches to identify genetic determinants responsible for this adaptation and collaborating on the implementation of genomics and clinical microbiology. Today, He's found time to talk to us about 20 years of sequence gazing. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say what a, a great honor it is to be asked to give this Marjorie Stevenson Prize lecture. Um, I first joined the Microbiology Society, or the SGM, as it then was, as a PhD student, and I've very much grown up um, in the society, and I have made some great friends and some great colleagues over those years. So this is a particular honor and pleasure for me to do this. Um, the talk I'm going to give you today will be very much a, a greatest hits compilation. Um, and I know that many of you will have heard some of these um, talks, some of these uh, examples before. Um, and, I, and I suspect that quite a few of you will have uh, been involved in, in the work behind them. Um, the title I'm using is um, 20 Years of Sequence Gazing. Um, it's a title that was given to me uh, a few years ago uh, for a talk by Stephen Busby, um, I think quite tongue in cheek, um, but actually I quite like it because it does sum up what I've been done, doing for the last 20 years. And I'm gonna try and explain to you um, why I think it's been important and valuable. So, um, if we think about the scientific cycle, um, it's generally um, generally shown in this form. Um, you propose a hypothesis, you generate some data, you test your hypothesis, you refine the hypothesis based on the data, and you generate some more data uh, to test the refined hypothesis. Um, and this is a, a cycle that um, is often used as the basis for, for thinking about how science gets done and how science gets funded particularly. Um, but I think more and more we have missed uh, an essential part of this cycle. Um, and that's, it doesn't start with proposing a hypothesis. It starts with exploring data, um, or at least it always should start with exploring data. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, let's say we went to a funding agency and said, uh, propose this timeline. I'm going to explore some data. I'm going to attend six years exploring some data. And then maybe at the end of six years, I'll probably formulate a hypothesis. And I'm going to spend the next 22 years testing that hypothesis. And maybe I'll publish it at the end of that. Of course, you would get laughed out. Um, there's no way anyone would fund this. Um, but of course, I'm sure many of you know what I'm talking about. Um, this is, in fact, the timeline of um, Darwin's development of the uh, theory of evolution. Um, where he started exploring the natural world um, for six years before he even thought about formulating a hypothesis, um, writing it down. Um, and then it took him a very, very many years to test that hypothesis uh, and generate supporting data for it. So maybe that's a little tongue in cheek. Uh, and, and certainly not all of us are going to write the origin of species. Um, but I think it does, it, it is important to think about how we explore data and how we think about data and that we shouldn't just rush to generate a hypothesis and do hypothesis driven research as the be all and end all. 
So that brings us the genomes. So according to the NIH, a genome is an organism's complete set of DNA, including all of its genes. Each genome contains all the information needed to build and maintain that organism. Um, and this description of a genome has led to it often being described as a blueprint. Um, but a blueprint, I think, is just too precise. Um, when we generate a genome, um, or when we used to generate genomes, we would spend a lot of time ensuring that they were hugely accurate um, and then calling and trying to identify every gene. So this is the genome of Neisseria meningitidis. Um, every gene neatly laid out, um, but it's masking a, a, a rather um, nasty secret. Um, we color coded these genes by function and by far the most frequent color you can see on this screen is this pale green color. Now this pale green color means don't have a clue, we don't know what it does. Um, and you can see that actually for the most of the genes, uh, we don't know what they do. Um, and that's also masking the fact that actually we probably missed quite a few genes in there as well uh, because we couldn't recognize them. So it's very easy to be seduced by this idea that a, a genome is a simple blueprint and we can define everything using it. And the other thing about the genome not being a blueprint um, is that um, a blueprint is, it carries the connotations of something being designed, um, something being precise. But of course, evolution is not an engineer. Evolution is a tinkerer. Um, and this is a, a lovely uh, phrase that Francois Jacob um, came up with many, many years ago. Um, and what this means is that, that, that evolution doesn't come up with the best design um, for an organism from scratch. It works with what it's got and it modifies it a little bit. It doesn't create things de novo. It modifies what already exists. It tinkers. Um, and one of the great things about genomes is you can see the results of that tinkering. You can see the evolutionary history of the organism, the evolutionary history of that slow modification over time written in a genome. And I'm going to give you an example. And it's an example from, um, from many years ago um, on a comparison between two enteric pathogens. And we have the, up here, Salmonella enterica cerevar typhimurium. This is a broad, broad host range bacterium, um, causes disease in a wide number of different organisms, but also causes gastroenteritis in man. And here is Salmonella enterica cerevar typhi. Now typhi is a host specialist, it means it infects only humans and it causes systemic disease in humans called typhoid fever. Um, so this uh, comparison has been around for a long time um, and obviously people want to know what determines, amongst many other things, what determines host specificity in typhi. Why is it that typhi is a specialist um, and only infects humans? Um, and many people have applied, um, have tried to apply uh, the standard molecular biology tools to these. And this is a paper from 95 um, talking about phenotypes for entry and persistence of different salmonellas in neuromacrophages. Um, and the summary of this paper um, says that these suggest in vitro and in vivo experimental approaches to identifying the genetic and molecular bases of host specificity. This work is in progress. So when we looked at the genome, um, and this is the genome of Salmonella typhi. Again, notice the large amounts of green in the genome. We were expecting to be able to go and find the genes that defined, that determined host specificity. Um, and unfortunately, we couldn't find them. Um, and the reason we couldn't find them and the explanation for why nobody had found these specificity determining genes um, previously was that um, was, was something we found out by staring at the data um, by just staring at the genes. And one of the things we noticed was this. So this is a zoomed in region, a comparison between Salmonella typhi on the top, and Salmonella typhi murium on the bottom. This is a six frame translation. Um, and these are the genes marked up in color. And what you can see is that typhi murium and typhi have this same set of um, six genes. Um, and these genes encode a tetrathionate reductase. Uh, these three genes encode the reductase. These two genes over here um, encode uh, a sensor regulator that detects tetrathionate in the medium um, and switches on these uh, reductase. Um, this is uh, important, actually, because tetrathionate is one of the uh, electron acceptors that typhimurium uses to survive in the gut. 
But if you see um, this red block represents similarity, and you can see these are almost identical, the black line represents a, a break in that similarity, and it actually represents a single base deletion in Salmonella typhi. And the effect of that single base deletion is called a frame shift in this gene. Um, and that's the sensor, um, and the frame shift it activates the sensor, which means that the organism can't detect tetrathionate and therefore can't respire on tetrathionate. And that's actually one of the fundamental um, distinguishing characteristics of Salmonella typhi in the lab. So a single base change, not the difference in gene presence absence, but a single base change that inactivates the gene um, that determines a, a strong phenotypic difference. And when we started looking in more detail around the genome, we found the same thing going on. We found here again, Salmonella typhi and Salmonella typhi murium. This gene here in typhi murium is called SOPA. It's a secreted effect protein, type 3 secreted protein, and it's involved in host interaction in typhi murium. And we can see the same gene exists, the same DNA is there in typhi, except there are multiple frame shifts which have completely activated this gene. So when we tabulated um, these gene inactivations, um, we found that there were 204 pseudogenes that we could identify in our initial annotation. And these are, are obvious pseudogenes. Now there are probably many more. And in fact, other people have subsequently um, looked in detail for, 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 for and found many more pseudogenes, but these are the ones we could see initially. Um, and this is the proportion of percent of genes, all genes that sit in these functional categories, and this is the, percent, um, the percent of pseudogenes. And what you can see is that pseudogenes are overrepresented in um, pathogenicity islands, um, in um, cell surface genes. Um, they're not entirely random. Um, and when we drill down on what some of these genes are, we can see that um, at least 22% of the genes, which is a large number of genes that we could detect, were involved in virulence and host interaction, including um, several type 3 secreted effect proteins, genes that were known to be in pathogenicity islands, genes that were known to be involved in host range determination. Um, and when we went on and compared two salmonella typhies, they are virtually identical apart from a large uh, inversion between the two genomes, we actually see that both salmonella typhies pretty much share the same set of pseudogenes um, with a few uh, additional pseudogenes either side. Um, and if we look at these shared pseudogenes, again, we can see um, the same uh, genes that, that we picked out before is being shared. Um, these are genes involved in host interaction, particularly host range. Um, and so what it tells us is that host specialization in typhi is not actually specialization. And the reason we thought it was, was just the usual human chauvinism that we think we're important. Um, but actually it's host restriction and it's host restriction primarily due to gene loss. Um, so this means that in a number of things, it, it, it shows that this evolutionary tinkering leaves a, a signature that we can see in the genome. Um, it tells us, it, it, when we started looking in other genomes, we see a similar process. We saw it in other Salmonella enterica cerevars, we see it in other human pathogens, such as Bordetella pertussis, and we see it in other animal and plant pathogens. And it seems to be associated with a recent niche change. Um, and this, this, um, this means that we can see the signatures of the previous niche, the previous um, lifestyle of the organism in genes that have been inactivated, functionally, um, functionally lost, but not physically lost, that are still in the genome. This again, this, this, this idea that, um, that, 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 that the genome is not a, not a blueprint, it's not an engineered thing, it's a, it's a, a process of, 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 um, of continuous tinkering over time. But it has to be said that not everybody agrees with our interpretation of this data, and this is one of my um, least welcome citations from the Journal of Creation, saying that um, this gene inactivation is entirely um, coherent um, with aspects of the biblical creation and form model. Now that's true. Um, of course, most of the rest of biology is not coherent with that uh, model, so we can skip on very quickly. Um, so we can see that a lot of bacteria, especially a lot of human pathogens, have undergone recent niche change. Um, but when did they do this? Um, so bacteria leave no fossil record. So it's really difficult to date 
bacteria. Um, we can estimate um, divergence dates based on the nucleotide substitution rates um, or the molecular clock. Um, and the best estimates of that molecular clock led to hypotheses that these, these changes may have been associated with the Neolithic revolution. Um, and we can see a number of papers that came out many years ago, some of which um, I have to admit have my name on, um, suggesting that, um, that these, these changes may have been involved, may, may have occurred as humans change from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a, a farming lifestyle, um, and human populations increased and became more sedentary and gave a, a, an opportunity for pathogens to emerge. Um, so we wanted to look, well, actually, no, we didn't. We didn't have a hypothesis. We didn't want to look. We, um, we started to generate data um, without a hypothesis. Um, the best estimates of the Merkel clock we had at the time, which we had no reason to disbelieve, were based on the divergence of E. coli and Salmonella, which was estimated to be about 140 million years ago. And that gave a substitution rate of around six times 10 to the minus nine SNPs per site per year. Now that mutation rate suggests that sequencing two members of the same sequence type um, would be foolish because they would only differ by a handful of SNPs. Um, and if we, um, if we think about a sequence type at the time, this is sequence type by multi-local sequence typing, um, that was the finest level resolution we had for typing most organisms. Um, and if two organisms were identical by multi-local sequence typing, that is, they had the same sequence type, um, then we would consider um, they were indistinguishable. Um, so it would have been quite foolish to have sequenced um, multiple indistinguishable strains, but we did. Um, the first one we tried was multiple salmonella typhies. And we found that actually in about 19 salmonella typhi genomes, there were actually a considerable number of SNPs, about 2000 SNPs in this genome. Um, so we went on and we did some more sequencing because that's what we did. And um, we took 63 Staph aureus um, of a single sequence type, SD239. And we found huge numbers of SNPs. Here, every row is, a, um, is a, 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 an isolate um, and every, um, every red tick is a SNP. And we can see that there are six and a half thousand or so total SNPs. Also, we can see if we look at the black bar across the top, this represents the core genome and the genome that's shared between all 63 of these isolates. And you can see that there's plenty of gene presence absence difference as well. So actually, the rate of change in bacteria was considerably faster than we thought. Um, and one of the reasons um, we were able to, 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 to understand this is because we knew that ST239 was a recently evolved clone. Um, it's a multi-drug resistant clone and we could guess that it probably emerged or started to emerge around the time of, um, of antibiotic usage. Um, and that meant that we had isolates of Staph aureus going back across most of the depth of the age of that clone. And that's really important because that allows us to start to estimate the substitution rate um, in that clone. So we could see if we plotted the distance from the root um, versus the date of isolation, that um, as the isolates get older and older, were frozen down longer and longer ago, they have fewer mutations from the root. Uh, and we get a nice clean straight line through this, a reasonably clean straight line, and it estimates a, an origin of this clone um, in the late 1960s which ties in with, with the first use of methicillin or around that time, this is a methicillin resistant clone. Um, so we could build a nice robust tree, but crucially we could generate this molecular clock. We could understand the rate of the molecular clock. Um, and it's three orders of magnitude faster than we thought. Three times 10 to the minus six SNPs per site per year, or around seven and a half SNPs per genome per year. And that's the reason why we saw so many SNPs when we weren't expecting to. Um, and this is crucial because it means that bacteria constitute measurably evolving populations. Um, and that means we can start to think about evolutionary analysis in near real time. And this is something that the virologists have been doing for some time, many years, 
Um, but it's only since we really understood that the mutation rate, the substitution rate was so much faster than we thought that we realized that we would be able to do with this with bacteria. Um, so what have the consequences of this been? Let's think about um, another methicillin resistant Staph aureus, SD22. Um, now, we sequenced um, several hundred SD22s um, and we built a tree. Um, and you can see in this tree two things. You can see a group over here, which represent quite diverse, um, deeply branching um, isolates and a group over here, which represent much, much more closely related isolates. Um, these are generally community acquired Staph aureus and these are hospital acquired Staph aureus. Um, and you can look at this tree and you can think, well, something probably occurred along this branch here, which made this group so much more successful that allowed its rapid expansion. Um, now these are methicillin resistant Staph aureus, but it's probably not methicillin resistance because each of these Roman numerals represents a separate acquisition of methicillin resistance into this, um, into this clone, into this clade, um, and none of the others have led to this expansion. So if we look at this tree um, in a different format, um, we can see uh, here this ST22A, the hospital acquired ST22. Um, we can see here the community acquired ST22s, um, and we can see the branch here in which something must have occurred, which led to this rapid expansion. Um, and what we can see sits on that branch is the acquisition of fluoroquinolone resistance by a point mutation. Um, so it appears that it was actually the acquisition of fluoroquinolone resistance that led to the rapid expansion of this methicillin resistance Staph aureus. Um, now, the other thing we can do with this, um, this tree is we can date it because we now have a robust molecular clock and that allows us to date this acquisition of fluoroquinolone resistance to um, the mid 1980s. Um, and the other thing is we, we can do is we can follow the movement of this clone around the world. Now these black lines represent isolates that are from the UK and the colored lines represent isolates for, that are from other countries. And you can see uh, uh, pretty much a single introduction into Germany and then a rapid expansion within Germany. You can see single introductions here into New Zealand, into Singapore at the top. So we can see that, um, that this clade emerged in the UK. We can date when it emerged and we can track its transmission globally um, from that point on. And even within the UK, we can look at transmissions within the UK and we can track them back in time. Each line represents an inferred transmission. Uh, and we can zoom right back to the earliest transmissions which appear to have occurred in again in the mid-1980s in the West Midlands. So what was going on in the West Midlands in the mid-1980s? Um, well, we were doing clinical trials on um, ciprofloxacin, the first fluoroquinolone antibiotic. Um, now it appears that um, that this clone, ST22, um, acquired fluoroquinolone resistance probably about the time and in place that we were doing clinical trials on, on, on fluoroquinolones. Um, and then it bided its time for a, a few years while uh, uh, those trials were concluded. Um, and then fluoroquinolones were used very, very widely um, across hospitals, the UK and the rest of the world. And that created that use of fluoroquinolones created a niche in which this fluoroquinolone resistance, that aureus, could spread rapidly and globally. Um, so we can see that um, we can see that uh, sequence sequence typing within clades, sequence typing within sequence types, uh, sequencing within sequence types allows us to look at transmission globally uh, and transmission across the country, but can it allow us to look at transmission more finely? So um, this is a plot from many years ago now, um, showing the rise of um, the MRSAs amongst Staph aureus in UK hospitals. These bars are the percent of MRSA amongst Staph aureus. 
Um, and you can see that um, from the uh, 1990s up to the turn of the century, there was a rapid rise in methicillin resistant Staph aureus, mainly driven by these two clones in the UK, EMRSA 15 and EMRSA 16. Um, around this time, there was a, a, a concerted effort to, to drive Staph aureus out of hospitals um, using rigorous infection control procedures and that um, here in the black line, the count of MRSA has managed to drive that down, but not to zero. Um, and the problem is that most of this wave of Staph aureus in UK hospitals, and certainly most of it subsequently, is driven by just one or two clades. Um, now, these are single sequence types, and using sequence typing as we had it then, we couldn't distinguish um, amongst members of this clade. And that meant that if two people in a hospital um, were carrying Staph aureus, um, you couldn't tell whether, um, whether they'd given it to each other or whether they brought it in separately um, because you didn't have the resolution. Now, we knew now that whole genome sequencing did have more resolution than sequence typing. Um, so the question is, could it, could it um, actually be used um, in the hospital? So we, um, we did a test on a set of retrospective isolates. Um, that had uh, been part of um, a recent outbreak. This is in the Addenbrooke Special Care Baby Unit. Mm -hmm. um, and the timeline was that three babies on the Special Care Baby Unit uh, appeared to have MRSA at the same time. And this triggered an infection control investigation. An infection control team found other babies. And this is a timeline of babies carrying MRSA. They found other babies carrying MRSA um, going back uh, a, few, uh, a few months. Um, they couldn't actually at the time determine whether this was an outbreak or not. And part of that was that there were gaps, and part of it was that there were um, strains at the beginning, the isolates of the unit appeared to have a different antibiotic resistance profile. Um, so they uh, instigated a deep clean and the problem went away. Um, and they put the the strains in the freezer and we picked them up later and decided to see whether we could say whether it was an outbreak using whole genome sequencing. So we sequenced these strains and we found that actually um, they were extremely closely related. Um, so each concentric circle represents one SNP from the last common ancestor and you can see all of these strains are within three or four SNPs of each other. Um, and given the SNP rate that we talked about, this means that they, they are very, very closely related and therefore probably re represent an outbreak. So we um, went and generated a, a, or dug through the freezers and tried to find more isolates that might be part of this outbreak. They had an unusual antibiotic resistance pattern, which helped us identify them. And we found multiple other patients um, that on sequencing could be linked back to this outbreak. And these were um, other babies on the ward who had swabbed negative at the time. Um, these are mothers on the, on the adjacent maternity ward. Um, who had screened negative, uh, and these were their partners in the community um, as well. And you can see clear transmission chains. You look at the purple, the baby, to the mother, to the partner, um, out into the community. So we could clearly show that we could track transmission um, of an outbreak. Now, at this point, something interesting happened, which was um, this outbreak had occurred only a, a short while previously. Um, and uh, the hospital um, contacted us and said that um, that there was uh, another baby on the ward who had um, MRSA and they didn't know whether this was part of the same outbreak because there was a gap of, uh, of a couple of months or so. Um, so we sequenced the baby and you can see the strain of the baby here is clearly um, part of this outbreak and it suggests that there was um, some form of carrier on the ward that had, had carried the uh, the um, outbreak on over that gap when there was no baby with MRSA. So we swabbed all of the healthcare workers on the ward um, and we found one healthcare worker who was carrying MRSA um, and we sequenced multiple strains from that individual, multiple isolates, and we found that they were clearly part of the outbreak and they had strains that matched the baby and were also matched close to the root of the, of the, um, of the outbreak. So that's... Um, worker was taken off the ward and decolonized um, and that was the end of that particular outbreak that we have actually continued to find this strain um, circulating in the community. So I think this showed that um, 
that sequencing can be used in real time. Um, and many, many people are now um, doing exactly that, showing that um, uh, using whole genome sequencing in real time for transmission control, infection control, um, and uh, transmission tracking in the community. So to sum up, I think, um, bacterial genomes contain vast amounts of information, huge amounts of information. Um, and that information includes uh, hints about their biology. It tells us about the recent history of transmission. It tells us about the deep evolutionary history of emergence and adaptation. But also in there is information about host interactions, phage-resistant antibiotic biosynthesis, antigenic variation, vaccine escape, and many, many, many other interesting things. Um, and I think it's incumbent on us when we are faced with this vast amount of data and this vast amount of unknown um, to spend time exploring um, and exploring with an open mind and not necessarily telling ourselves that we have to have a hypothesis first before we go and look at data. We don't. Um, we can discover things. We can discover things we didn't even know we were looking for um, by exploring, exploring data with an open mind. And that's what I'd like you to go away um, with as the take home message. So clearly I've talked about this um, without naming anybody else because there are far too many collaborators and co-workers to name who've been involved in all of this. Um, this is my group, we're currently in the group. These are people who've come through the group in the past. Uh, many have gone on to, 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 to positions um, within microbiology and within universities across the UK and across the world. Um, all of this has relied fundamentally on important collaborations, many, many important collaborations. This is just, this is a list of some of those collaborators. Um, and um, particularly the work I talked about at the end with Sharon Peacock, the work I talked about towards the beginning, a lot of that was with Gordon Dugan, um, and we're going to be talking to both of those later, but many, many, many other collaborators. Um, many funders um, have contributed to this work, most notably the Wellcome Trust over many, many years. Um, and when I look back, um, I looked back on, on the papers that I've published over the years, and um, I found that there have been so many contributions from so many people, um, far too many to list, um, but I, there are three and a half thousand co-authors from 88 countries. Um, and I think that um, that ability uh, to collaborate um, and to collaborate widely has been one of the most um, joyous parts of, 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 of the career that I've been able to have. Um, so thank you very much for listening um, and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much, Julian, for that incredible uh, talk. So my name is Sharon Peacock, and, and together with Gordon Dugan, we're going to be asking you some, uh, some searching questions now. I'd just like to say before we start, um, Julian, that you know, that talk was, was, uh, was fascinating to get that bird's eye view of the work that you've done. And I'd just like to say that uh, you know, the contribution that you've made to biology over the years has been phenomenal. Not only have you done a lot of the, the biological work, but you've actually released all those genomes. And that's been a huge benefit to uh, the, the world, in fact. I'd also note that a lot of your work is very focused on uh, really important public health questions, questions that lead to uh, better understanding of disease, better uh, infection control, and better uh, therapeutics. And so it's important to note that your work is going to be, you know, have a lasting impact on human health in the future. And the list of people that you've trained is also really impressive. So your footprint in microbiology, I have to say, is huge. And you have been a, a personal inspiration to me for many years. And so I look back on my CV this morning and, and I was fortunate enough to be a co-author on uh, papers in 2004 on genome sequences of Staph aureus and Burkholderia pseudomaliae. So, and and you were you you were and are an inspiration uh, to me. So, thinking about inspiration, what I'd like to ask you is, you know, who's really inspired you uh, throughout your career? Um, 
many people. Uh, I think um, I'm going to choose two uh, during, especially when I started at Sanger, you know, which was kind of an accident. You know, <laughs> it was answering the right job advert at the right time and um, and and having some of the right experience. I think John Sulston, um, the way that he set up Sanger, the way that he set it up as an open environment. You talked about data release and data availability. You know, most of that came from John. He was um, a completely unreconstructed socialist. Um, and the way that he set up his science and the way that he set up the Sanger reflected that. And it drove that um, emphasis on collaboration, on broad collaboration. Um, and, 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 and that entire ethos about how um, the data would be open and, and, and we would collaborate broadly on, on not just generating the data, but on interpreting it. And I think that a lot of that came from John, a tremendous man. And also Bart Burrell, who was my first boss at Sanger. Um, you know, Bart was a tremendously modest man, but did a huge amount of work, you know, going back to the time that he worked with Fred Sanger. And I think he took from Fred Sanger this, this idea that, that you can do valuable and useful science by generating data, by, by generating techniques. You know, Fred was not, um, Fred was interested in, in, in how you generate the data and he made those techniques and those tools available to other people to make discoveries. Um, and, and, you know, some people look down on that data generation and that tool generation as not real science. And, you know, I would, I would dare them to say that Fred Sanger wasn't one of the most influential scientists <laughs> in modern science. Um, and Fred was always interested in tool generation and data generation. Um, and, uh, so I would say that, you know, Bart, Bart brought that, that emphasis to me. Um, and Bart was always willing to, to push other people and stand back. Um, and, and that was a tremendously powerful thing for my career um, and for many others as well. So those two, I think, that's an important principle for all of us to, to take home, isn't it? To, uh, yes. to stand back and let people do their brilliant stuff. Thanks very much. Gordon. Uh, hi, Julian. First hi, of all, obviously we worked together for over a decade at the Sanger and I want to thank you on two levels. One for being a brilliant scientific colleague, but also being incredibly reliable and loyal in the sense that I've always felt I could go and talk to you about absolutely anything, which we did often and frequently. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It would always remain between us, and uh, it, it was so invaluable to me uh, during that period, so thanks on that note. And I want to sort of just, uh, I guess, one of the things that always intrigued me, I know you worked on many different uh, genomes over the time, but I was wondering which gave you the most pleasure in terms of the science you got out of it. Uh, is there a particular organism, I mean, you mentioned a couple in the talk, but is there any particular organism which was either challenging or something frustrating or something really uh, that has uh, grabbed you? I, yeah, I think choosing a favorite genome is like choosing a favorite child. It's not, not something I'm gonna do. I think some of the most, some of the most interesting things were where we were able to discover biology by really getting down dirty with the raw data. Um, and, you know, I talked about the pseudogenes in Typhi as an example of that. You know, many of the automated tools that people were developing at the time would have just skimmed over that. Um, they wouldn't have noted the pseudogenes, they weren't looking for them, and they'd have given you a gene list and you'd have worked from a gene list and you would never have really dug down to that level. So um, I think some examples, Bacteroides fragilis was always a great one because there were anomalies in the assembly, really strange anomalies in the assembly um, that required days and days of sitting in front of a, a computer screen, working out where bits of sequence went together and where they joined and how they didn't join. And, and the outcome of all of that was that, that there wasn't a single assembly, there were multiple assemblies. And the reason for that was because um, Bacteroides was um, 
it had specific mechanisms to flip parts of its DNA. So you couldn't assemble a single genome because there were multiple versions of the genome existing simultaneously. Um, and out of that um, came uh, the mechanism for phase variation and immune evasion and, um, and surface variation, diversity generation in Salmonella typhi, in, in sorry, in Bordetella bacteroides fragilis. You see, I get them all confused, they're all the same. <laughs> in bacteroides fragilis. So, and, and there were other examples of that where, where simply really just digging into the raw data enabled you to make insights into the biology, which I think or I always found most fascinating. Actually, I, I would have guessed you might have said this is fragile. It's quite interesting. It's a commensal organism, not necessarily what we regard as a pathogen. Yeah, it's got all these enormous evasion mechanisms, and and it correlates to things like uh, pertussis, as you say. Yeah. What I'm going to do is hand back to Sharon now and make sure mm. I don't log the conversation or log. Her. Thanks, Gordon. So Julian, behind you is a picture of the, the vet school in Cambridge, yeah. and you're now a professor um, at the vet school. So that's brought you into, to, into contact with a, kind of a wide range of, of, of people thinking about animal health. And, and in that really marvellous introduction, the video that we saw from uh, at the beginning of the session, we saw how broad microbiology uh, goes in terms of our, our lives and our planet. So I wonder what impact it's had on you to move to the vet school in terms of the way that you're thinking or what you're focused on in terms of your work. Um, can you just... Um... Yeah, I, 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 I would put it the other way around. I think I was, I, I was interested in moving to the vet school because I previously had an appreciation of the breadth of microbiology. And, and crucially, that... Um, well, a couple of things. Microbes don't discriminate, except, you know, things like typhi, which has got locked into a dead end in a single host. But generally, most bacteria are fairly promiscuous and will infect multiple hosts. And that's because, you know, we, as eukaryotes, I talked about, you know, human chauvinism, we think we're important. Um, you know, eukaryotes are really not that diverse compared to microbes. And, and most pathogens just see a eukaryote, you know. <laughs> um, and, and that's why we we have this sort of, this 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 one health agenda um, where you know it's important to look at, um, at at how bacteria how bacteria um, interact with the system as a whole and not just pick out human beings as a small part of that system. You know, if you you, you have to understand how how bacteria are transmitting through the environment, through animals, through people to really understand what they're doing in people. So, you know, I, I think all the way through my time at Sanger, what interested me was not the organism. Um, we worked on many, many different organisms and that was a de deliberate strategy because we were interested in processes. We were interested in evolution. We we're interested in transmission. We we're interested in adaptation. And one of the strengths of biology because of its diversity and microbiology particularly is it gives you the ability to look at the same process occurring in multiple different systems and that allows you to analyze the process of evolutionary adaptation of transmission of spread um, without getting hung up on the specific details of a specific system which may in you know may end up being so specific to that system that they're re relevant to the broader system so i think one of the things that genomics and the genomics revolution has allowed us to do over the past 20 years is move away from this idea of model organisms, looking at a single bacterium and assuming that that's representative um, uh, and start thinking about systems. Um, and genomics allows you to make those comparisons across organisms and start mm. to look at systems rather than, mm. than organisms. Mm. Thank so you. I think, well, I think we could talk actually all day, good. quite right. honestly. I mean, I would love to, to talk all day, but unfortunately, we're not in a position to. So I'm going to close the session uh, yeah. now. Um, is that correct? Am I correct in, in thinking that or do we still have time? Let me just check. Let's see what Fiona says. Fiona. Can my colleagues tell me? There's still a bit of time. Okay, fantastic. So Gordon, over to you. Yeah, so one thing I was going to ask you, obviously with Sharon on the call as well, the, the surveillance has been incredibly powerful in the COVID pandemic. Yeah. 
And I think it's going to, it's actually shown the power of genomics above and beyond. So I was wondering what your predictions are for the future of how, how we might use this technology over the next 10, 15 years. Have you got any thoughts of that? I know I haven't prepared you for that, but just off the cuff thoughts on that. I think, I think what COG UK, you know, which Sharon has been instrumental in setting up, um, has shown is that there is a value of being proactive in genomics. Um, and one of the things that, 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 that I've been doing and, and, you know, most of the time with Sharon and Sharon has been doing along with many other people is trying to show that, that, um, genomics in surveillance and genomics in hospital transmission, it, there's, there's a, there's a, it will have enormous value in the future. Um, but there's a, an activation hump to get over first you have to start doing it before the benefits accrue and it's often very difficult to get um, systems to switch um, to accrue those benefits and you know you have to make the micro arguments about these small increments that you will gain from from putting sequencing into into hospitals and into transmission and into public health um, but actually the benefits you gain are much much larger um, and I think COG has proved that um, in, in its ability to, you know, most, most crucially to detect new variants, detect where they're spreading. And, and that wouldn't necessarily have made the case. If we'd have used that as an argument right at the beginning when, when COG was set up, I'm not sure that anyone would really have listened um, because it seemed too hypothetical. Um, but through force of of, of, of argument, getting it set up in the first place and having the, the UK government and welcome willing to, to put that upfront investment meant all of those downstream benefits accrue. And I think the same will be true. You know, sequencing will become routine in hospitals. In many places it already is. It will become routine for diagnostics. It will become routine for transmission tracking. And actually the benefits that will accrue from that downstream will be far, far larger um, than our ability to predict those benefits now. Um, and I think that's where we're going. Yeah, well, I would actually argue that one of the reasons why they were willing to put up that 20 million was because the work that you've contributed over the last 20 years, Julian. Well, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of that is actually just basic science and, as you say, maybe sequence gating. It's, it's, it's intuitive, it's innovative, and actually now it's given the politicians confidence enough to put that money up front in the belief that these people will be able to generate something of great value to the society out of it. So on that note, I'm going to hand back to mm. Sharon. Thank you very much. History is everything, isn't it? In, and we have a very strong history. And, and Julian, you've contributed a great deal to that. We had, do have uh, time for one more question, which I posed to you before I wrap up. And uh, uh, what, what in a couple of sentences, can you just explain to us what you're likely to want to really um, target next in your scientific pursuits. What's the big question that you want to go for now? I think, Sharon, what my talk has been about from the beginning is that... It's the opposite. <laughs> it's, the big, it's the opposite. It, yeah. I, I don't know what the big question is. I yes. don't know what the vision is. And, and as I pointed mm -hmm. out to my colleagues, you know, visions of uh, uh, religious maniacs and drug addicts. I mean, you know, I think, um, <laughs> you know, what I've tried to say, but I've maybe maybe it's a failure in my imagination, but I want to get the see, I want to see the data first. And I want to see what the data tells me rather than me telling the data what it's going to produce. So I'm going to finish with that. <laughs> That's great. Well, that actually is con completely consistent with your talk. And may you continue to gaze at genomes for many, many years, because I can only imagine there's going to be a great deal more to learn about microbiology based on the work that you've done. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Keith. So I'd like to wrap up. Um, Duke, any final comments before we close the session? No, just that uh, I didn't think I was going to get anything out of the talk, but actually it was a brilliant <laughs> over. <laughs> 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 I thought I knew everything that Julie had done, but of course I'd, the yeah. vision was overview was absolutely wonderful. So and and it's the interpretation. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Gordon. So, well, thank you so much. Um, so the recording <clears throat> of this session will be available on the virtual event platform from the fifth of May, twenty twenty one, for a period of a month. So you'll be able to come back and listen to Julian again. Um, <laughs> so. Well, so if you're if coming up next are three parallel sessions which start at 10 
so you can make your way back to the platform to select the session that you wish to attend. But it remains uh, for me to say a massive thank you um, to uh, yourself, Julian, to Gordon, to the organisers of this session, um, and what, what a great session it's been, and to the society as a whole. So thank you so much, and we'll close there. Thanks. Thank you.